So thanks, Mike. I guess I'm buying the round of drinks next, right? So Dr. Opheim is appointed as the political observer because my wife told me no politics, no political jokes. So if his hand goes up, it means I crossed cross the threshold, and I really shouldn't do that. So we're going to talk about change management. In the upper right-hand corner, some people don't manage change. In the lower left-hand corner is how I manage my change, and that's actually how I went to college and medical school, because my father sold coin purses, amongst other things. And I still, to this day, look for giveaway coin purse. They're very hard to find as giveaways, but maybe the lab, Department of Lab Medicine would like to uh, buy some. <laughs> And then you've got the little UW credit card. That's the ultimate lean in change management. There is no change. So you don't have to manage it at all. OK. <clears throat> so you've, you've got to figure out, is change good or is change bad? And if hopefully you'll come away from this talk that change is good. And I've been reflecting lately around change and one way I did it was look at my bookshelf and it used to be all hardcore pathology books and then through the years it's actually undergone this incredible change that many people walk in the room look at them and then they walk right back out again so they don't want to talk to me because if you got books like that who wants to talk to somebody like that? But that's been a fairly big change for me in my career. And I, I think, in retrospect, actually a happy one. So let me just ask you, what are your recent changes? What have you changed, either for yourself or your staff or people around you? And just think about that for a couple of seconds. Um, and if you don't come up with anything, that would be problem number one. But if you have, you've come up with something, that's good. Now ask yourself, what got changed for me? Because that happens to all of us. And so it's a different kind of change. And maybe they went through different, two different processes. So for me, uh, you know, you got a new assay coming along, a different approach to diagnosis. We argue about this frequently, a different system for monitoring different uh, aspects of the processes in the laboratory. We change our duties in our sections all the time. And I've been changing piles in the office because if you move them from one place to another, <laughs> it, it looks better. But, yeah, you know, they don't go away. Uh, and I keep trying to hand them to my colleagues and that doesn't work. And then what got changed for me and for, at the University of Washington, you know, the university is going through a big change with the transformation. And uh, you know, I get a lot of emails about that. But it can also be just something, everything's hunky-dory, and you just got a new lot of antibody. And then people are unhappy because they got to validate, and you got to sign the forms, and da, da, da. So there's a lot of things around you that get changed all the time. They don't necessarily go through, nor do they need to go through, a change management process. So what are the changes you've experienced that were not needed? And you know, maybe you're a very uh, happy person and you don't perceive of any of those. Uh, with age, you'll find that you get unhappy about those types of changes. And so this is um, kind of my quick, quick list there of having extra paperwork or being forced to develop an assay that you know is completely worthless. Uh, Logos and slogans, this is great. So, you know, MasterCard just announced their change of logos, right? So you tell me five years from now how many people will be able to look at two colored circles and know that that's MasterCard. I won't be able to do it tomorrow. I can't do it now. I don't know what color those circles are. So anyway, but that happens and we have to live with it. And when Holiday Inn and Motel 6 change their logos, I'm in big trouble. I, I just got to say that. So. And then new cap standards come through all the time, and every time there's in the summer when they come out, we moan and groan about those types of changes that maybe we think weren't needed, but maybe it wasn't their fault anyway, and CMS made them do it. So we are really in a world of constant change, and sometimes we actually want to facilitate change, and that's what we're going to talk about. But there are some really desirable consequences of not changing. 
So think about these, and that's, I mean, I mean, you're stable and you're predictable, and then look at this down toward the end. You don't have to meet new people. I mean, many of us are pathologists. We're not right up front with the people, you know? Like that little room, you don't want new people coming in, certainly don't want to learn their names. But those are the reasons, well, some of the reasons why we don't. Uh, I didn't even know there was such a thing as cognitive dissonance, but now I realize I'm a poster child for it because I suffer from it all the time. But it really, this disruption of your normal life, um, if you can avoid it and not have to change, then you don't suffer from any of these. Now, there are some bad consequences of not changing. So you can think through that, right? And one of those is stagnation. And stagnation, of course, what's, what happens if you stagnate? You breed disease. And if you breed disease, what happens? You die. And so that's the bad consequences of not changing. And if you go down the street and you do a scientific survey of 100 people on the street, hardly anybody would, would say, I mean, it's like 0.01% would say they'd rather be dead than change. Okay, so most people prefer change over death. And we're talking about not just yourself, but organizations as well. And I think all of you here know that, that if you're not growing, moving, maturing, uh, doing new things, first of all, it's not fun, but second of all, you, you start taking on the risk of an early death, and that's what you don't want to do. So why change? Well, you have a burning platform. And I want to talk about one burning platform. Dr. O'Pom will raise his hands. So we're not going to talk about that platform. However tall it is, we're not going to talk about it. But that's a burning platform, and that actually starts to bring people together around change. And it's a very effective propaganda technique. You want to change because you want to improve. You take some new directions. And you know, for us in this department, having just listened to Tina's um, Sterling Grand Rounds in Pathology, you know, what, six, seven, eight years ago, we didn't have any molecular stuff. And now it's like, it's incredible. You know, how did we live without it? And it's all around us. And it's a new direction. It's fairly exciting. And then we want to grow. Uh, we do have external pressures we have to respond to, and some of those are competitive. And this department, in particular, likes to be out ahead of those competitive pressures. They like to be the ones, the one that's putting the pressure on others. And if you do it effectively and soon enough and hard enough, you neutralize that competition. Uh, and then there's opportunities. Um, so those are all the reasons to change. So who is involved in change if you're going to have it? So one take home is leadership. If the leadership is not involved in change, it is not going to happen. And if leadership's not involved, it will not sustain. All of you guys in here are leaders. And so as you institute change in your areas, people are looking to you to be that leader, not just a supporter, but really to lead it. You will have to change yourself for certain changes, particularly around external influences. You have to take on new roles, new responsibilities that maybe you don't want to do, but you have to do that in order to help the organization change. You're probably going to have to change some of your colleagues. I come up with an occasional good idea, like every 30 seconds. And it's really, that I, coming up with ideas is pretty easy. Convincing my colleagues that one, they're good, and two, they should do it, that's where the challenge is. And I'm not very good at that. And so hopefully, by tossing out a lot of ideas, one of them will stick with my colleagues. You're probably going to have to work on those who report to you in very special ways. And for certain things we do in the laboratory, you have to exert change outside the laboratory. And that is a challenge for us because we don't have control. We're moving out of our sphere of control, and we're having to use all our good political skills and social skills to convince other people they want to go along with our new schedule of testing, for example. 
Um, and then you have the issue that you really have to watch out for those who don't follow you. And that's a real issue. And so the who turns out to be important because you've got to have that, all of those items checked off or you're gonna leave some people who are not gonna go along with that change and that's gonna put the change at risk. Okay, so you could have hire somebody to do change for you. And I think most people in the world, in the business world now would say that's the wrong way to go. You can hire an expert to help you and direct you and coach you, but change really has to come from the inside leadership and the people involved. And the sooner you can get the frontline people involved, the more effective you're gonna be in pushing that change through. When do you wanna change? There's two different philosophies. Depends on how big the change is. So if it's gonna be over a long period of time and it's a journey, you're, you're gonna to have to start that journey about now because we've been on the lean journey since, uh, see, I just looked, 2003 and we're still kind of there. Uh, and it's been a very long haul. And I didn't think it was gonna be that long. And it really has been. Uh, so, but we started very, you know, at one point and got going. What the Japanese will do is they do their change a little differently. They'll study, 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 talk, talk, talk. And then after all of that's done, the change will happen overnight. I mean, really, really fast. But you've done a tremendous amount of prep work before. So it depends on the organization, how many people are involved, which method you can go. The other piece of change that's really important is, okay, you decide we're gonna change today, you're gonna have to do it tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And you really can't make change happen having once a month meetings. That's just, de de once a month meeting is deadly. You know, wait till the moon's full and then we're all gonna get together. This is kind of a daily activity that one has to do. And then if you are serious about big time change, you're, you're doing it in part for the future generation. You're setting the stage for the next group of people to come along and they have to be involved in that. You can't do it with just senior faculty. You can have the junior faculty along. Somewhere in there you have gotta decide on the velocity. Is this change going to happen fast or slow? And um, it will be, be dependent on uh, really what you're going to do. So what do you want to change? Well, as I already said, you've got to change yourself. Because if you're not on board with it, and particularly if you're the leader, you just don't waste your time. You may have to change your culture. And we're going to talk about that hopefully at the end, if I don't ad lib too much. And that's really the hard part, is changing culture. And that doesn't happen overnight. That's a pretty slow process. But that fixes your changes in place. You may have to change your goals and objectives, just as if you were moving from assistant to associate professor. You've had goals and objectives to get promoted to be an associate. And once you're there, you may have to set some different goals and objectives around what you want to do to go the next level in your academic career. Uh, you may have to change your processes. So we both are getting ready to put in these fancy new, um, is it Apple computers? No, it's Epic, Epic, yeah. I thought it was Apple. Uh, Epic computers. But, you know, we gotta change our processes. And if we don't change our processes and we just computerize what we have, we really will miss uh, the advantage of switching computers. Uh, I don't do that at home, obviously. I just change to the next model number and everything's kind of the same. And you may have to change your systems. Um, but kind of the idea is change is something you consciously do. Okay. And if you wait around for magic, you're really waiting around for someone else to affect the change on you which is you thought about changes, you're probably happier with the things you changed and you participate in than the changes that others made to you. You can worry about 
all those hundred billion things we worry about on a daily basis from regulations to the finances to whether the assays are going to work. But if you're going to change something, you actually can manage that change very consciously. And so you ask yourself, how can I do that? Well, one of the ways is this tremendous amount of preparation that I mentioned. And that, we, we do it every day unconsciously for small changes. We actually prepare. If we're going to have a new instrument, we do a lot of preparation before that platform comes in the door, hopefully. Good labs do, and this is a good lab here. And so you're really ready for that. And that preparation does something really important. It gets everybody bought in. It gets the anticipation going. Everybody's pretty happy. I'm, gee, we're going to get this new instrument. It's going to be better. Or we're going to have a new assay. We're going to open up a new section. And that has buy-in, so everybody's not as surprised as when it comes in the door. Another piece of uh, success for change is you want to win coming out of the gate. So you have to consciously think about, what am I going to do that's going to work? You do not want to make a change and have it crash because it's, everybody's going to remember you for the crash. And if you have six more successes, they're still going to remember that great crash that you brought to your section. And so you've got to figure out when you change, what are the, what are the first things I'm going to change that are going to give me something that's successful? Big changes can be tough, and I've been through a lot of those now. But they can be made easier by slicing and dicing them into smaller parts that because of your preparation and your thoughtfulness, you've thought, how am I going to sequence each of those parts so that two years from now, I'm where I want to be. Um, and I have make a change a month to get to that point. Um, you can also make changes in one area. Let's just say you want to change. Uh, how you wear lab coats in the laboratory. You could make it globally, and 10% of the people would hate you. Or you might work it through one section, make it work, everybody gets happy, and then you replicate it in the other sections. So that's another technique of making big changes more palatable to people. So, Let's get back and just talk a little bit more about how to make changes. So again, leadership and the introspection that you need to think about, not just do I want to do this, but how am I going to do it? What's the effect on everybody? And so you need some quiet time to plan. And we're very lucky in the state of Washington because we have ways of getting at that deep introspection here. Okay? Um, it was much harder before that. I can say. Okay, so the other, so, so another piece is to lead that change. And that's actually for this group of individuals, that's where the fun is. You're leading and you're helping other people get there. And that's very, very rewarding. It's also very time consuming. And you got to ma manage that change process and you have to communicate. And the first project that Joanne and I did in the laboratory, we communicated every week. We brought people in. We had little, um, I don't know, we didn't serve any food, but we brought people in around in our core laboratory. We kept them up to date every week. It was great. We didn't do a newsletter. It was face to face. We thought it was wonderful. And then when we turned on this new core laboratory, we just got blow ups from the technologist. And our next project was managing the blow ups of the technologists with whom we thought we had communicated like more than we've ever communicated in anything in our lives. And so um, it takes a lot of time to communicate and it takes being out on the shop floor, if you will, to get that. But that communication is, is really important. You got to be transparent and um, that can be difficult in some cases because you may be sitting on information that you're not ready to share more broadly, like we're opening up this new section of the laboratory because um, 
we think it's going to be good and help us to get bought out by a commercial company. Well, you might not want to communicate that to everybody right up front. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so, but that's going to come back to bite you eventually. Uh, and so the transparency is really important in that. And that's just being honest with your coworkers. You really need to find the clear and compelling reasons for the change. It's not just, well, I think, you know, we need some blue analyzers in here because most analyzers are red. Or for me, uh, you know, my biggest gripe is I'd like to have all the analyzers go from left to right instead of some left to right and some left, right to left. Because if they all go the same direction, you can build work cells around it. If they go different directions, it really uh, hampers building a good work cell. That's probably not a good enough reason. A good enough reason might be it's going to make us more efficient by 10%. That, that's something you might be able to sell. And then as you change, you're going to get some new energy if you've done it right. You're going to be able to harness that energy and put that new energy into promoting the next round of change. And that is where it gets even more exciting because seeing the energy in your coworkers, uh, not all of them, but most of them, and then seeing them start to move forward themselves is just is the most rewarding thing that I think I've seen in my career. Okay, so now you say, okay, well, this is great, but we're laboratorians and we need a procedure. So I went to look for procedures on this. Uh, the worst place I found had 81 different ways of changing. I, went, I didn't look at that website very long. So I picked out one up website that had eight. And it was like the longest website ever of this method and this is the pluses and this is the minuses and this is the diagrams and this is how it works. And in general, they're all pretty similar. You also have to realize that each of these methods is owned by a person that conceived of it who then spun off their own company as a consultant and has their own website. And so there's actually a tremendous amount of stuff out there from all these consultants that are doing it. And so that's the good news. The bad news is, well, how do I pick from amongst all of these. Well, you can see real quickly if you do McKinstry, it's, you're going to need outside help for it, so that's going to cost you more bucks. And so you might not want that one, uh, for example. Um, most of these boil down to this diagram, and it's a pretty interesting diagram, where, and I think it describes the changes we've been through at Children's as well. You're starting out on that new process, and as you do that, you sink. And you go down low, and things aren't looking very good. And for some people, and we've seen this in departments other than ours, when they start going down is when they rebel, and the project ends and fizzles. And they actually, in spite of all the meetings they had and the work, they don't get anywhere. They don't have anything to show for it. And so for us, we've gone down that dip, and then you come out more productive at the back end. And so why is that dip really important? It's because of the people. So you're getting ready to change, and what happens? That fear comes out, and everybody starts to worry, and there's angst, and you're just going crazy. Then they get mad, and who do they get mad at? The leader, which is you, right? So that's a problem. And then there's frustration, and then some people say, I, I'm, I'm just going to go to my office, shut the door. I'm not going to worry about this. And somewhere in that, after that neutral zone, as you start to come out of the depths of darkness, and you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, you start to get engagement and excitement, and then the energy just starts flowing. So what's our job on that curve? Our job is to make the nadir as shallow as possible through every technique you can come up with to get rid of frustration, apathy, and anger, which is communication, and to make it as narrow as possible. So you're spending less time 
doing it. And so the period of pain is not as great and it's more narrow and you get to the energy faster. And that is accomplishable with managing the change. I know some of this is really sounding kind of crazy, but I'm going to get to the touchy-feely part later. <laughs> so the um, guy that I like the best change-wise is this guy named Cotter. And um, he, he's a thought leader. And I, I was a thought leader in high school. They were mainly dirty thoughts, but I was known as a thought leader. Okay, and and so, and he of course founded a company. I was surprised to know they have an office here in Seattle. Uh, but in addition to his book on leading change, he wrote this one, which is essentially the same book about penguins who are leading change around their iceberg melting. Okay, and so I'm just going to take you through his. Um, scheme of things and remember in the business world everything goes in a circle a cycle it's really for us it's just like our PDCA cycle more or less this has got more steps in it but the centerpiece is important you've got to have a huge opportunity and you want that opportunity to be something everybody can put their hands around you don't want it to be as nebulous as some of the things I'm talking about it's got to be concrete we are going to increase our stock value 20% next year. Or we are going to increase our market share in the reference lab business 25%. People can get around that, particularly if the bonuses are tied to it. Okay. So how do you do it? So you create the sense of urgency, and you want it to be intellectual, but you gain something, the experts say, if it hits your heart also, just like all the letters you got before Christmas wanting you to donate. So there's a head piece. Uh, donate to us. You donated last year. Uh, this is really good. It's going to come off your taxes so the money doesn't go to build the, I can't say it. And, but all of them have a picture in it that gets at your heart. So that's kind of the urgency there. What, what do we need? Who's not doing well unless you contribute? Okay. Then you want to build a coalition. And I didn't actually realize that we did this. We actually did this. And I, one of the things that happened to me, was I was part of this coalition. And that was very, very useful. So it was non-hierarchical. Everybody was kind of even Stephen in that. It was a diverse group of people to really help oversee that change process. And we all had a lot of energy. Um, and with that, you want to have the strategic vision that becomes motivational, aligns with the organizational or your section of your laboratory or your department, uh, aligns with it, and really outlines the future state. And we don't do that very much. And there's a technique that we use in Lean that goes from present to future state and it's really very effective. People can see where they're going. Well, they can really help you get there. If you keep that hidden, you're not transparent, you don't communicate, and they can't see what that future state is, it's harder to get people on board. And then you want to start enlisting people to work on it. And some people would say you need to get 15% of your organization involved in that change right up front in order to really start to accelerate. And then you start to bring in some new things. You innovate. And more importantly, you take away the rules. And that can be difficult because we all live with regulatory rules. We live with state rules. We live with county rules. Uh, we even have city rules. So you, you, you have less rules you can get rid of. Although, when we've done some change, people have looked at the rules. And I, I, I know when Joanne and I did the first project, people came to me and said, gee, we don't understand why you put this policy in. I said, well, it's not my policy. I didn't come up with that. And they said, well, you signed it. And I go, well, everybody says it's yours. I said, I don't know where it came from. Let's just make it go away. And so getting rid of the rules is actually fairly liberating. Um, we talked about the short-term wins. So you want to win. And there's two pieces of that win. You want to win with data. 
so that instead of saying we got better, if you can put a number to it for laboratorians, we got 25% better, that catches everybody's attention. It also forms your elevator speech. The speech that you give anytime you're on the elevator to anyone who's not wearing a hearing aid because you want to tell them that speech and let them hear it and you, and you tell it to everybody. And pretty soon everybody is, says, you can't believe all this great stuff that's happening down in the laboratory. I just heard about it and they, you know, they got 25%. Um, so, so that's pretty important. And then as you move forward and you're sure that you're doing the right thing, you want to add more people and gain and start to accelerate. So now you're in the acceleration phase the of, the, of your velocity curve. And as you make those changes, you really have to make sure that they're going to stick. And one way of doing that is to take old practices and put the new ones on it without getting rid of the old ones. Sometimes you've got to get rid of the new ones, uh, old ones and just build a new process. Other times you can just amend it to make it a little bit easier for, for people, and you still have to communicate. Okay, so think about what your urgency is. You want to pick that big opportunity and a cause if you can, and you like to have that cause something that instead of people feeling like you want them to do something, they actually can believe in the cause and they want to do it. Uh, you want to remove the barriers, and the best example I can give you is when we did our, again, when we did our core laboratory, um, the consultants that helped us with that, and we had a lot of help on that, but it was actually a lot of teaching help, they wrote into their contract two things. One was an incredible amount of food. I mean, this guy was eating like crazy. Uh, he had a food budget that the CFO almost had a stroke over. And then he had another budget for things. Things. And it wasn't that big, but it was things. Didn't say anything more than things. And the things were a credit card. And anything he needed for that project went down to Office Depot, picked up a couple burgers at Kid Valley, because he had a good, you know, he could pay for that out of his budget. And he just bought what he needed. So he needed a printer. They didn't have a printer to use where they were working. Well, they could walk, you know, four labs away and use a printer. He said, well, I'm not going to do that. That's waste. Goes down, buys a printer. Did he ask IS? No. Did he ask purchasing? No. Did he violate every rule in the hospital about buying a printer? Yes but he had a contract that allowed him to do it. Very simple, but very effective way of removing barriers. Then you want to pick the wins. We talked about that. Uh, and try to get a good management guidance team in that's multi, going across the hierarchy. So top, bottom, pretty soon you'll see at the bottom is the top. And then the last piece that I'm not going to go into because that's a whole nother talk is auditing, but sustain, 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 because every project you will do will backslide unless you build into it ways to keep it from backsliding. Okay, so the Cotter approach has a lot of advantages. It's got structures, resources. It helps you build that climate for change, and it begins with wins. And sustaining is an integral part to it. Many of the other change techniques don't emphasize sustaining in the same way. And it's really, while we didn't call it the Cotter Change Management at Children's, it's really the same concepts that we use there. Now let's get down to the science because I have to show some equations. And, and I, didn't, I didn't know anything about this. I'm going to tell you, I didn't know about these equations before. But again, a group of consultants came up with this dice thing. And they said, how do I know if this change is going to work? And they studied a whole bag full of companies, I'm sure all of which paid them to do that, so it's a good gig. Um, and they came up with this equation. So D's the months it takes. I 
is how engaged is the team? Is the team made up of people that you actually just wanted to lay off and you need them to do something because they were the only people that could do it? Well, they're not gonna, that's not very good versus a team that really, really wants to affect the change. And you get a points, but the team gets multiplied times two. Okay? Then you got the senior management. So is senior management on board, capable of leading, showing it, communicating it? Or did they just say, ah, okay, do it if you want to. Yeah, you know, don't call me if you spend over $5,000. Okay? Well, they get different points. Okay? And there's a multiplier with them. And then there's a, um, how much commitment there is by the, the team itself and then how much effort you have to put in. I never even thought about this effort business, and it's pretty interesting. If it's only going to take 10% of everybody's time to make that change, that's a lot easier to do than if you have fewer people and you want 40% of their time, particularly if you don't take anything, any of their duties away to do it. So you can make it happen at the 10% and it's harder at the 40%. Okay, so that's the deal. You can also use this if you have multiple projects, and some people do this. Some companies have done it with, you know, 300 projects that year. And they put these scores in, they monitor the scores, and then if the scores start drifting to a higher number, that's the one where people descend and start helping them out because they know it, that project is at risk of not making it just based on this equation. And so uh, the numbers are how many companies scored at that uh, dice score level. And then the top is we succeeded, and the bottom is we failed. So the bigger the score, the uh, more likely you are to fail. And so it roughly comes out. You know, it doesn't have a great predictive value, but it's better than just winging it, I think. And so it might tell you, not so much the project's gonna fail, it's which aspects of the project are putting it at risk, and what do we do about that before we start the project off? And that's probably its greatest uh, value. Okay, so the idea is that you use some change management process that is structured, that's your procedure. You're gonna go by it and you're going to follow it, and you're not going to deviate from it because it gives you some, some structure, and everybody can see what you're doing. Or you can just evolve, and then you kind of don't know how it's going to come out at, in the end, I think. Okay, so that's actually the easy part. So I've talked about all the reasons for change, why you want to do it, how you would do it, how to pick, and you can go out to the internet just like I did, how you can pick a way of doing it and follow it. And it all, actually, this is not rocket science. Remember, as a friend told me, you guys went to college, right? Everybody in here went to college, I think. Went to high school, and you're in the honor societies, and you're in, you know, the honor societies in college, and. I wasn't in one in medical school, unfortunately, but this is the kind of people that we are fortunate enough to work with. In your honor societies, how many of those people went into business in your honor society? Can't think of any, okay? That's why this isn't rocket science. That's why you guys can grasp this and jump on it really, really easily, okay? All right, so now, we're getting down to the hard part, which is the fear of change. Okay, and the issue with change boils down to the people. We've talked about leadership, but now we've got the rest of the people. And people will naturally feel done to and they're gonna resist. And you can run around like our president of the hospital used to do and just say, resistance is futile, it's not gonna work. Or, we can incarcerate them in Japan for two weeks and break, break them down just like they were in a prison camp. And then they come back and they're, not, they're, they're very pacified at that point. Um, so 
you, you've got to get around that piece to get around the people. People will be deaf. So you're going to communicate, 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 and people will not hear you. So this acute deafness is very akin to working in an embassy in Cuba. Okay? So everybody longs for the old days. You've heard it now. I mean, you're hearing it now around the country. It may really have been bad, but people would like to go back to the good old times, whatever those were. I don't want to go there particularly. The change itself with people running around and building new processes can be very chaotic. And the productivity, as that curve showed, will drop. There's no question. People will have to work harder to still have the same output and meet the same standards that you want. Um, we have another particular problem in the laboratory is we fix things. And when we, f we have a problem in the laboratory and we fix it so it never happens again. And we're very, very good at that because that's the way we think. But sometimes on big changes, you can't fix everything. And you have to take a reward for improving something some. And you have to say that's a success. I didn't completely fix it, but you know what? I fixed half of it, and the next time around, we'll fix half of it again. The next time, we'll fix half of it again. That's pretty you, you, you can tell a lot of people that and they'll buy into it. Laboratorians are much harder to buy into that. And you're going to lose something. And people are going to resent you for what they lost. It might be their favorite chair because they're used to working sitting down and now they're working standing up. And they're going to resent you for that. They won't tell it to your face. Um, there's a psychology, and let me just boil this down. Uh, fast readers can get through it. But it basically says, as you get older, you do not want to change, okay? That what's familiar to, familiar to you, you want to hold on to. And so the people we've lost, I'd say most of them, which is not many, have been our older uh, individuals in the laboratory. That change was just a little too much for them. And we weren't smart enough to realize that they were a more at-risk population and work with them, and you don't want to, I mean, you, you, I mean, that's your most experienced people too, and you don't want to lose them. Uh, there is an entire literature on the psychology around this. It was painful for me to read because I'm not that kind of person, but it actually makes a lot of sense. And probably what these two guys, I think it's guys, may not be guys, what they point out is the resistance to change that people have may be completely unconscious. That they may not really realize why they're resisting that change. And you can get at that if you want to do some psychoanalysis. I have no earthly idea how if you're going to change something in the laboratory, you have time to psychoanalyze everybody for their assumptions and their resistance to change. But if there's a few people, you could apply those techniques and start to really ask, well, what are you, what's, what are you afraid of? What's, what are you gonna give up what you're not happy about? And it may be that there's, and these guys would say that there's usually false assumptions. Maybe they're assuming that because we're making these changes, they're gonna be assigned to a satellite laboratory in Tacoma, and they don't like that. When in fact, you weren't even gonna have a satellite, satellite laboratory in Tacoma. And so they had this false assumption, and they were unconsciously wanting to resist. I know it's a little broad, but that's what, what these guys are saying. So with certain people, you can do the psychoanalysis. So if you're going to change people, there are, again, ways to prophylaxis, prophylact against it. Um, and the big thing is you can go out and change all the people. It doesn't necessarily change the organization, uh, just changing the people. There's more to it than that. And in order to change the organization, we're starting to get into the culture almost, is you need to sh may need to shuffle people in larger ways with new responsibilities and new roles and new relationships 
kind of wiping the slate clean, if you will, which can be more painful and you're giving up a lot of your old friends and your, your colleagues in a different way, but you may have to do that. And then of course, if you coordinate and have teamwork, it's a lot easier if you can get everybody on board together for a common cause. So just some advice. If you can change what people dislike, you have a win. So just start out by seeing what people really, really don't like and make that change. Uh, another technique that we've used that's been incredibly successful is put the patient at the center. It is really impossible to have an argument over what's best for the patient. I, I just You can't argue. Everybody that has ever been a patient knows what they want. And so if you orient to the patient, it's not about me, it's about the patient. And those arguments disappear fairly quickly. Uh, start with the successes and celebrate them. Um, yeah, Mike leads a very nice pizza party. He'd be happy to come over and MC one for you. Uh, you've got to work on it every day, steadily and incrementally. And I mean every day it takes your energy to do it. Uh, avoid technology. Get everybody aligned. Uh, data helps. Um, facts are very difficult to argue with. And if you can put the data up there, people will buy into it, particularly laboratorians. And remember, there's two kinds of data. There's the data we deal with and we believe in, and then there's business data. And sometimes you just have to go with the business data as opposed to the scientific data, and you can't sit around and argue about the SDs on it. You just have to say, yeah, it looks like it's more likely than not that this data would support what we're gonna do. And then it takes a lot of energy. So if you're going from, in, in the reactive reactants there, they're not real stable, right? And then you do a reaction, you put them together, and you reach a new steady state that, you know, you can make it higher, but here lower's better because it's a more stable situation. And you have that curve, it's inverted from what we talked about. But your role is the catalyst is to make it a lot easier, less energy for that whole reaction to take place. Uh, we're gonna, well, let, me, let me put this up for just a second. You can go through it. It's a lot of gobbledygook, and there's 15 different ways, and actually there's people specialize in organizational culture. I, I just had dinner with one the other night. Uh, and uh, somebody from my childhood, actually. And, uh, and it was pretty interesting. But sometimes, if you're going to have a really big change, you are going to have to change that culture. And sometimes the incremental changes will help you get to a new culture. And we're fortunate to have uh, a, a culture here that works really well for us. Uh, but you may want to change that, and I think part of the UW transformation is about changing some of that culture that we have. That this is the way we've always done it, but we kind of got to do it a little bit different way now uh, for a variety of reasons. And so you could have someone come in and talk about changing the culture. I'm not going to show that, but I'm going to show the iceberg, which is pretty interesting in that if you ask people, well, what defines what we do here? Well, we got our we get a lot of policies and procedures, and we've got our matrix structures or hierarchical structures, and we got. I'm sure we have a vision. Uh, you, you know, all of you have had the opportunity to sit through vision statement making and loved it. Um, but that's really not necessarily what the organization is about. If you want to change the organization, it's about the bottom ninety percent. And I was digging out the, our unwritten rules at Children's uh, the other day, which are still operative. They're still alive after uh, 15 years. We did a big organizational psychoanalysis and came up with these unwritten rules. And, and they still govern everything that happens. And we've never been able to make them go away, actually. Uh, but anyway, but that's what you've got to be thinking about if you're going to move forward 
with organizational change and changing the culture. Uh, so it's not just enough to change the people. You may, in your preparations, in your change management, think about how you're going to change the culture and think about how you're going to measure it. And there are ways to measure your changes in culture. Um, so one way to get at culture is to take, understand the culture that you have and what's good about it, and then amend to what's good as opposed to destroying that, kind of keep what you've got and add to it and change it just a little bit and figure out what's negative about it and see if you can take it around. And to be truthful, I talked about the unwritten rules. They're hurdles. They're not necessarily negatives. In some ways, they're not bad. Uh, so that may be the reason we never did away with them. Uh, you want to match the strategy and culture, and Mayo has a culture, and that really helps to define them as much as their strategy. Um, you want to pick out that future state for the culture and figure out how you're going to get there and honor the culture that you have, the strengths of it, and work with that and keep the weaknesses there and see if you can substitute something for the weak aspects of the culture. Uh, these guys say, think that in addition to the formal communication, that it is incredibly important to maintain the networking, uh, the peer interactions, and the hallway conversations, and that that is actually integral to bringing culture along and helping it to support the change management that you want to have. And so sometimes we think about that time around the coffee maybe as being wasted time, and I think they would argue, no, that may be some of the most valuable time that you can have is sitting down and having a cup of coffee uh, with someone. And so you can measure that cultural evolution if you want to. Okay, well, I know it's been uh, not what you necessarily wanted to hear because it doesn't get down to a bunch of science, right? Uh, it's not a new technique. I didn't show any, um, well, we used to say dot blots, but now I know we don't show dot blots anymore. We show squiggle charts. Uh, and so that makes it a little less exciting. On the other hand, it's something we do every day. And if you think about it, I think that you probably, uh, if you aren't using all of these techniques and ideas, you can use some of them and then the changes will happen better. And when I reflect back, particularly early on in my career when I had to change a lab from manual assays, and I am that old, that my first lab I worked in, it was all manual assays. Manual calciums, manual bilirubins, manual creatinines, you name it, it was manual. And I had to automate the lab to platforms. And I did a, such an incredibly horrible job of change management. I, of course, nobody ever told me about it. And it would have gone a lot easier if I'd known just a little bit of this. And, uh, and it would have gone a lot faster, and I probably wouldn't have had to check my car for bombs every night, actually. So anyway, so we got time for questions. Joe, that was, uh, that was great. Um, for the naysayers or the people who are resistant to change and asking why are we changing, is there ever a time to say, because I told you so? I, I think it doesn't get you very far. Um, Last night being an example, Kent, put your hand down. I think it doesn't get you very far to be truthful. And what I saw is there were certain people we had to bring along, and those are the ones that we incarcerated in Japan, which included me. Um, and then there were talks with people, and then the people that just couldn't get it Essentially, essentially, we ignored them. And they could just go about their daily business and they weren't really participating. The most enlightening time I had was, was probably the, the hardest core individual. 
and I was taking a group, I, I didn't even know who they were, they were people from Switzerland somewhere around our Bellevue operation. And I was walking in, that physician was there, and he saw me, he said, what do you got here? I said, well, I got a bunch of Swiss, they want to see what we've done here. He says, come on in, let me show you how good this clinic works. I couldn't shut him up. He resisted, 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 and now he was the champion because he finally hit him of how good the change was for his life. And what we tried to do, we, weren't, we didn't measure this. What we, the physicians kept preaching, we want to send the doctors home an hour earlier. Well, wait a minute, what? Yeah. If we can cut out enough waste in the doctors' lives that they can get home for dinner, we have been successful. We didn't measure that. But to be truthful, I think they, at, at the end of our work, they were getting home a little bit earlier. So you just, I think you just have to ignore them. Uh, we also did something unique, is in the recruiting, we flipped it. So during recruitment for department heads, people were, said, this is our culture, this is what we do, this is how we think, read this book, and tell us if you want to get on board with that. And we had some recruits that said, this isn't what I want to do. And we said, thank you. And they were off the list. And so it was recruiting forward for that. And we've done that with technologists as well. Different set of questions. Don't give them the book to read, but you know, can they fit into that culture? And pretty soon, even if they don't fit into it, if everybody around them is in that culture, they're going to assimilate. And I think that's probably what happened with the resistors. Any other questions, comments? Anybody awake? Okay. I think, what? Nice talk, Joe. Um, I, I didn't hear you spending much time talking about local champions sort of within the organization and recruiting local champions to move things forward. And I wondered what your experience is and advice about that. Uh, our experience was that we went top-down champions, which then kind of gets back to your question. People didn't have a choice. So the department directors, the VPs, all those people got indoctrinated and had to have feet on the ground doing work and learning by doing. And then we started to bring more people into the learning by doing, particularly in the surgery area, uh, trying to get the throughput in the war better. That's what the surgeons wanted. They didn't want to have 30 minutes of downtime between cases. They really wanted to move forward on the cases. So that is how we got the champions going. And then champions just emerged from, from that. And we, we did have a big office. As we developed champions, we moved them into an office, and they became facilitators for everybody else. We lost our chemistry supervisor that way. He did the first project, did the core lab. He loved it so much. He was the first employee in our lean office. 